Hey team, I want to talk to you about overhead cranes today. So, you know, I, I'm seeing on jobs people are overlooking stuff, so I thought I'd just want to cover this topic real quick. <clears throat> you can get a lot of this information from AISC. Um, if you work for me, come come over and talk to me. I'll show you some more references that I have. And any crane job, you need a lot of information from the crane manufacturer before you can begin. Excuse me. You need things like reactions, wheel locations, lateral loads, longitudinal loads, elevation of the buffer, deceleration rate, et cetera. You know, uh, you need a lot of information. For multiple cranes, you you need uh, information for the run-up distance between the cranes with the buffers compressed. So there's a lot of information you need in, as a consultant to do your job. Uh, types of cranes, there are six categories of cranes, um, you know, Really, as consultants, we live here in the A to D range, uh, and, and there's also this E to F, which are not as common, uh, but the vast, vast majority of cranes are from A to, uh, to D. And really, from A to D, you know, from a design standpoint and a consultant, you're, you're going to use the same methods for everything. So the MBMA manual provides the cases for the crane loading. So here's what you'll see in there, <clears throat> you know, whether you just have a one crane and, and then moving up to multiple cranes. Uh, I'm going to whip through a lot of this information quickly just because if I just throw it at you now, you're not going to retain it. So um, uh, you're going to have to do your due diligence and, and look all this stuff up. But will I, what I will mention is, you know, looking at your worst case scenario where you have multiple cranes, multiple aisles, you don't have to come up with your own cases. You you can just follow this right here. So if you have multiple aisles, multiple cranes, this is it. You you like if you have four cranes in, in one aisle, you, you really only have to worry about two of them. And if you have multiple aisles, you only need to know the two adjacent aisles like you're designing the column. So you, you don't have to come up with additional cases. You, you just have to look at what MBMA uh, does. The building code provides the load combinations, which is interesting because if you read there, the LRFD combos, they, they don't really touch it. They don't really tell you what to do uh, for cranes. But then the ASD, they talk about, you know, uh, you don't have to co combine crane loads with roof live load or with more than three quarters of the snow load or one half of the wind load. <clears throat> so you're not taking full crane full snow. You're, you're taking portions of that. So if you're going to come up with your own combinations for LRFD, yeah, it kind of has to be in line here. But the, the code is not explicit when it comes to LRFD combinations. <clears throat> you know, when it comes to cranes... The crane columns are the support of the runway beams. Uh, you have several different choices here. Um, uh, the, the bracket is the most common, um, but you have to pay attention here. R50 Max, it's not by code. It's a recommended thing. Uh, I've worked for manufacturers that go up to 55 caps, um, and, and that's fine. In, in theory, you can do more, but you get diminishing returns. And and you also have to pay attention to um, you know fatigue. So 50 kips here is the uh, uh, 50 55 kips is about as big as you want to go on a bracket. Uh, for for cranes here, you know, the step columns you're going to want to go about 150 kips max. They say about 50 tons. The other thing here is as for light cranes about 10 tons. That's not true. You, you can get up to a 20 ton with like a single 20 ton in the aisle. Um, but if you have uh, multiple cranes in one aisle that are 20 ton, I mean, you're going to really exceed that 50 kips max real quick. Um, and, and these are, it says, for very heavy cranes. Note in all of these cases, all, uh, you know, six of these cases, there's always a restraint at the top and the bottom. And if you look at that carefully, AISC design guide number seven, um, and other references, you have to restrain the top flange. You you want your connection directly to the top flange. You don't want to make it lower because cracks become prevalent. Now, with that said, you got C and D. Uh, 
those are heavy, but with C, you want to just design this W section. Um, uh, you don't want to have to use a KL over R the full height. You can just brace it to the uh, building column and, and you'll just be fine. You don't want to use HSS. I mean, you can, right? You, you, as long as you do all the checks and run all your numbers and okay, the, the advantage of an HSS is that you eliminate the need for these weak access braces, but you really have to look at that crushing of that flange up there. Where if you use a W section, obviously you have more material out there at the end of a W on the flange. So, um, Crushing that flange is not as big of a problem as it is for, say, HSS. Um, this this category D here, you can see it's got a fixed blaze base plate with with class E and F cranes. You really have to pay attention to deflections. I mean, they're running that thing 24/7, um, and so you'll see this is common for heavy duty stuff. You know, categories E and F. Uh, these two are really for outside. It, it didn't have to be physically outside. All, all you really have to know is that you don't have a building column. So in the four f cases here, you have a building column that goes all the way up to the roof. So it's, you know, you're, you're supported at the bottom, you're supported at the top. However, these combinations are uh, as if you don't have support at the top. So in this one, it's doing a planar truss. You know, we're, we're straining that lateral load right and left on the page by putting this into a lateral truss. Um, and, and this one uh, over here, uh, it, it's using a fixed base plate. You will notice that there's a roof truss there, but it says in this note, that's if it's going to be enclosed later. So if, if you don't have the roof and you want a step column, you would cut that column right there, you know, right here, and then you would never have a roof uh, you know, come into uh, a play later. But if you, this is a very discreet column as opposed to the truss. Uh, obviously, there's economies in this, uh, and this would be much stiffer. But if you're, you don't have room, um, you, you can do a fixed base plate. Just, you got to keep those deflections down. On the bracket, uh, you have some limitations here. Again, 50 to 55 caps. 20 ton crane capacity, uh, less if there's multiple cranes in uh, in the, on the aisle, or if you have a, a, even a 20 ton crane with a large bridge or a large runway, you, you might not get that um, capacity that you're looking for. The bracket length, as defined here, you know, from face to column to center line of the runway, you want to hold that to about 20 inches. You know, you're diminishing returns. Uh, if you go out lo uh, longer distances. The bracket length to depth ratio should be kept to about 1.2. In other words, it's 20% deeper than it is wide. Um, that bracket, you're going to design it like any other direct weld fixed connection, but you must consider fatigue. Um, uh, look, if you run the numbers and you you know, as a consultant, we're always um, risk adverse. So, um, you know, just throw the stiffeners in. We're, we're not talking about big money here, uh, but if, if something does go wrong, the welds start to crack, the, uh, the flanges start to crack, I mean, the solution will be to throw in uh, stiffeners, right? So just throw them in from the beginning. It's just um, uh, cheap insurance. You know, my suggestion for bracket sizes are W1636 under 40 kips and a W18 by 50 over 40 kips. Keeping in mind, of course, that, you know, I'm thinking about 55 kip max. If you've got, if you're going to exceed that, there, there's nothing in the rule book that says you can't. Um, but, you know, these are good starting places. You want to extend your cap plate beyond the column flanges and place bolts beyond the flanges. So here's a diagram. Diagram. So here you can see where the cap plate extends beyond the flange. We put the bolt outside. We don't want to put the bolt inside the flanges of the column because it rotates. It puts undue stress on that bolt. It'll either wiggle it loose and the nut comes off or it'll just snap the bolt over time. So uh, yeah. 
don't oversize the cap plate. Half inch should be sufficient in most cases. You have to check, of course, but let's just say you overdo it. Let's just do at a gross uh, number. Let's just say that cap plate was, you know, two inches thick. You're never going to do that, but still. What happens is, is that that plate becomes stiff and you get something that looks like this, right? You, if the plate's not going to bend, it's going to kind of bend at the column and it's going to snap that bolt. So just don't overdo it with the size of the cap plate. It's, it's unnecessary anyway. Bolts need to transmit longitudinal forces. So longitudinally, that, that bolt's going to, you know, take those those loads. Three-quarter inch should be sufficient in the vast majority of the cases, um, but you have to run the numbers. You, you can certainly o uh, oversize one inch or better, and there's no harm in that. Uh, use pretension bolts everywhere on the projects uh, on the structure or they become labeled. So if you have beams in the roof and, um, you know, the motion of the crane does kind of shake the building a little bit, um, you, you just don't want those bolts working their way loose. So if you use pretension bolts everywhere on the structure that's attached to the, to, to the crane, um, you know, that's just a, a smart thing to do. Use pin connections. So, uh, you know, when you're doing those weak access braces on your on your columns, don't do it like this um, because it does put some uh, rotation in there, right? It, it just snaps those bolts over time. There's a lot of fatigue involved. Here you see a pin uh, type connection for the weak access braces. We want to add braces for lateral loads on the top flange. So if it, this is our runway beam and this is our uh, building column right here, and there's the section we're looking down, we want to make sure we're restraining that top flange for lateral loads, okay? But because the beam bends, you can weld here, and that gives us our field adjustment. But we want to put bolts here um, so that... Um, you know, we get restraint longitudinally, or we don't get restraint longitudinally. We want this to have a little bit of flex in there. Uh, so we're going to put a longitudinal slot, and we're going to finger tight, and there's a lot of different ways of doing that. But basically, we won't, We don't want to pre-tension that bolt. We just don't want the nut to come off. We just want restraint laterally. We don't want any straight restraint longitudinally. We're going to add braces for the longitudinal load on the bottom flange. So if this is our exterior wall and here's our runway and here the longitudinal force, is, the arrow is showing it going down, we, we want to put that brace in a direction so that it's close to the bracket. So that what we don't want to do is pick up lateral loads. We do want to pick up longitudinal loads. And, and adding the brace for longitudinal loads on the bottom flange is a practical matter. Because if you put it on the top flange, um, you know, that let's say this is an angle and you put it on the top of the flange, the leg is up and it just interferes with the crane operation. So putting it on the bottom flange is the way to go. So here you see a special strut. Uh, so if you have bracing, you'll put that in this plane. You know, metal building guys, they, they want that, you know, three inches or four inches off that outside flange can conventional building uh, consultants will put it, you know, more in the middle of the column. Um, but either way, you can brace this all the way over to your girts and then your girt has to be designed for that. There, there's a lot of different options and I'm just showing you kind of one configuration. Um, yeah. Pre prevent that lateral. We don't want to pick up lateral. So here, let's say you're on an interior column. You got a, an aisle on both sides of you. Um, by adding this tie, right? We're coming back. We're, the, the first one, I'm putting the brace out to the brace. Uh, we're putting this brace to the special strut uh, outward, right? You got that bolt near the near the uh, bracket. But here, I'm showing it different. Uh, we're we're kind of bracing backwards. And, and there's your brace line. Well, if you do that, it's just good practice to put in a, an additional strut right here. Uh, and that dissipates the load. So when you are going to pick up lateral load and these braces have to be designed for it, you, you, you right, so you've got two things going. You know, uh, if you're trying to do this by hand, 
it, it becomes indeterminate. So 